Okay, I can't quite decide whether I'll stand here or use the mic, but I'll, I'll try here for the moment. Um, welcome back from lunch, everyone, and uh, welcome to Dublin if you're, if you're not here from, or not from here originally. Um, my name is Mark, and uh, I'm going to talk about NFV. Uh, right, okay. So to introduce myself a little bit first, um, Mark McLaughlin. I'm Irish, as Haiti mentioned, and I've been Irish for 35 years. Um, I've been an open source developer for 15 years now, and my um, introduction to open source was actually at Intel's Fab 10, which is west of here. And funnily enough, my boss at the time actually happens to be in the room today, which is funny. Um, my first full-time gig on open source was actually at Sun Microsystems, which is just north of here, very close to here. Um, but I've been at Red Hat for the last 12 years or so. Um, so I joined Red Hat as a desktop um, engineer, but since then I've been working on um, virtualization, just the general kind of virtualization in cloud space for the last 10 years or so. Um, I've been lucky enough to be working on OpenStack for nearly five years now. Um, basically, I was the, the first person at Red Hat to start working on OpenStack, and I, I've, you know, I've really had a blast since then, contributing heavily to OpenStack itself, but also helping to, to build a kind of a, a large engineering team um, working at working on OpenStack at Red Hat. And luckily enough for me, um, or some, some would say commiserations to me, i become the director of engineering of that group just in the last three months or so. So I've a new challenge taking on, um, you know, the challenge of, of managing a large team. So this talk, um, I want to talk about NFV, um, but I want to come at it from the angle of those of us who, you know, aren't deeply... Um, you know, really deeply rooted in the telco space. I think some of us sometimes has a, has a tendency to kind of fail to connect to this topic to really understand what NFE is all about. Um, I did a blog post on this maybe two years ago, um, which I think helped a bunch of people. Um, but because it was the Red Hat Telco Vertical sponsoring our our our, um, our sponsorship of this this event here today, I thought I'd, I'd talk again about NFE. It's my first time doing this as a talk, so um, hopefully it's useful. So just to take a little bit of a step back for a minute and talk just broadly about virtualization and cloud. Um, so I, as I said, I've been working in this area for 10 years or so, but my, my focus has always been on the compute aspect. Um, and that's probably maybe the most mature aspect of compute, right? We, we, we've had these kind of compute virtualization capabilities for quite a while now. They're quite mature. We kind of know what to do with them. We know what, um, you know, launching virtual machines looks like, snapshotting them, live migrating them, all of this. Um, where all of the interest really now is, is, is kind of at the application layer and, and how to use these technologies. On storage, kind of similar, but maybe not quite as mature, but we do n now kind of know how to do distributed scale out storage on commodity hardware. We know how to, to do things like thin provisioning and snapshotting and all of this um, at, at quite large scale um, with software defined storage. Um, but for me, it's, it's really kind of networking is, is the last frontier, right? It's like, do we yet know how to do kind of really large scale, multi-tenant, automated, interoperable networks, um, you know, running on commodity hardware? Um, you know, have we really managed to kind of decouple the application from the, the, the physical network layer? Have we figured out how to reproduce an application's network? Have, have, we, have we really figured out how to automate all of this and really treat it um, in the same kind of software defined way that we, we currently know how to do um, uh, compute and storage? I think not. Um, and I think, you know, really over the last number of years, we've seen a lot of uh, focus in this area and a lot of, a lot of um, progress. And really what we're, we're doing here is we're imagining what, um, you know, a, a new, uh, a future kind of style of a network would look like. So for me, there's, <clears throat> there's really kind of two major elements to this kind of transformation of the network. The first is um, around the data plane. And so if you think about... You know, if you think about a, a kind of a, a traditional network of, of today and, and look across that network at all of the forwarding elements, all the forwarding devices like routers and switches in the network, um, typically these are, you know, black box appliances that come from the, 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 the network equipment vendors that we've all come to know and love over the last 20 years or so. Um, but, you know, you're looking at this black box um, appliance and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's software and, and hardware locked together. Um, the, the idea here is... Um, can we, you know, can, can we disaggregate the two? Can we think about the software and hardware layer in these forwarding devices separately? Um, and so I think this is kind of what you're seeing 
with the likes of um, Cumulus Linux, or the likes of Facebook's um, Wedge top of root rack router, or the likes of Open Compute's only kind of net or network device provisioning service. And so the idea here is, can we get to a point where forwarding devices are no longer these special case black box boxes in our network, but instead they're just other servers, just um, other servers that we manage and we provision and we automate in the same way that, that we um, think about other servers for computer and storage. Um, now, admittedly, these boxes will always be somewhat specialized. They're going to have a bunch of network ports, of course, um, and they'll also have some specialized switching ASICs inside them. But can we kind of fundamentally think of these uh, uh, in the same way that we think of, of um, other servers? So that's the data plane. Um, the other element, I'm sure we've all heard of, of SDN, um, Software Defined Networking. But to me, that this is like another, another element of disaggregation, right? If you look at all of those forwarding devices in your network, um, the, the data plane um, and what we call the control plane is kind of aggregated together in, in these boxes too. So in terms of managing and, and configuring um, these boxes, what we tend to do is we go around to each of them individually and we configure them with a UI and, and, a, UI and a CLI. Um, and these, you know, these boxes around your network, they do share state, but it's distributed state that can be very slow to converge over routing protocols. The idea, I think, with software-defined networking is if we separate that data plane and that control plane, and we actually essentially take the, the, the control plane off the boxes um, and move it to a, a, a more kind of central location and put an API in front of, of that control plane, can we now get to a point where we can globally um, and in an automated way through an API manage our entire forwarding fabric in our network? Um, so one thing you'll often hear described about or talked about in the context of, of uh, SDN is something called OpenFlow. And what OpenFlow is about doing is when you separate the control plane and the data plane, like the, the capabilities provided by the data plane, data plane are quite straightforward. It's packet comes in, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to process it? What port are you going to send it out in? Um, and if you think about the data plane in that context, how do you program the data plane? And o OpenFlow is basically a way of programming the data plane with a set of rules about what to do with packets. Um, so if your boxes become essentially more um, dumb devices that expose the data plane over OpenFlow, and you've got a central um, SDN controller configuring them all with an API in front of them. That's, that's essentially what I think of, of software-defined networking. So everything I've talked about so far is relevant in the kind of benign, you know, safe world of the enterprise data center, but, but what about the telco world? Um, for me personally, I have to admit that, you know, throughout my career, I've tended to shy away and kind of keep the whole telco space at kind of arm's length. I, you know, I'm not too interested when people start talking about carrier-grade real-time or 5 nines requirements. Um, and I kind of laugh to myself, you know, if, if you start a technical conversation with, you know, lives are on the line here, if, if there isn't a dial tone when someone picks up the call to make an emergency call, it's, it's not a very kind of safe way or uh, inviting way to start a conversation. So I've tended to, to stay away from the telco world. Um, but <clears throat> in 2012 or so, October 2012, um, I visited a local... Um, a local company here who's a Red Hat partner. And basically I was there to just talk a little bit informally about OpenStack and, and talk about my kind of experience of OpenStack and where I think OpenStack is going and answer some technical questions. Um, at the end of that kind of informal session, one of the questions was, um, have you heard of NFE? Have you seen um, an NFE white, white paper which was just published by a standards organization called Etsy? Um, and you know, what, what role do you think OpenStack will, will play in this space? And so my initial reaction, kind of hearing a little bit more about it was, you know, this is really, you know, I went straight for the pets and cattle debate. This really sounds like cattle, right? This is, um, you know, this is, is, you know, really kind of specialized um, applications that, that really, you know, they're never gonna fit in that kind of, um, cloud abstraction where you've separated the operator from the, the application owner. Um, they're never going to be kind of this kind of scale out model of an application. Um, and that was my initial reaction. But I did go and read the, the white paper after the, um, our session. 
And so this literally is a wall of text, right? Um, and I guess, you know, I've no direct experience of dyslexia, but the, the, the way I've always understood dyslexia is you're looking at a sheet of paper and the words are swimming in front of you. And this, this is kind of the way I felt when I was reading this stuff. It's like, how can I pin this down and actually make some sense out of this and, and really, you know, figure out is this, is this relevant to what we're doing? Um, at the time, I couldn't, but over the years, I've, I've you know, I, I, I now kind of understand a little bit better where this is coming from. And so essentially, with NFE, we're talking about network, net, network operators. Um, when they're looking to launch new network services, they're, they're finding it difficult. And why are they finding it difficult? Because the network services they're providing are typically um, provided as hardware-based appliances, and they rapidly reach end of life with, with little or no revenue benefit at that time. And if you think about the telco world and the competitive pressures that telcos are under trying to compete with the, you know, the Googles and the Facebooks and the, 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 you know, the Netflixes and what have you, you know, with, with their rapid innovation cycle, um, if, if your way of competing with that is kind of constrained by these hardware-based appliances, um, you, know, you wouldn't be too happy with the situation you're in. And essentially, NFE is a reaction to this really troubling situation that the telcos and, and network operators are in. So for me to explain um, NFE, I, I use this magic decoder ring, right? We start with CSPs, which are the telcos, the communication service providers. You know, we're talking about the Vodafones, the, the Telefonicas here. Um, they're in this competitive environment. They're trying to you know, keep up and provide new services. Um, and they're providing these new services by acquiring um, them from network equipment providers. Um, so these are the likes of Ericsson or Nokia. Um, and the, the kind of devices we're talking about, the kind of functions we're talking about here are kind of NAT devices, firewall devices, intrusion detection, mobile packet core, content caching, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and the NAPs typically provide these functions or historically have provided these functions um, to the telcos as what we call middle boxes. And so middle boxes, completely new term to me, but apparently middle boxes are these hardware-based appliances you know, big boxes with this functionality essentially locked inside of them. And middle boxes tend to be, you know, they're quite expensive. They take a long time to roll out. Um, there's a long kind of innovation cycle on them. Um, because they tend to be a bottleneck, you have to provision them for, for maximum capacity. Um, and it's, it's, it's really not a happy situation. But what if we could unlock you know, the, 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 the functionality on, on these devices. What if we could un unlock these, hoist them out of the hardware, provide them as software that runs on virtual machines, on arbitrary compute storage and, and networking infrastructure, um, and for these applications to be re-architected so that they can scale out horizontally and so that they can be more tolerant to, um, to infrastructure failures. Well, that's what we call a VNF, uh, a virtual network function. That's literally taking that software out of these middle boxes, putting them in virtual machines, re-architecting them um, to be able to run on this infrastructure. And the, the infrastructure providing all of this is, is called NFE, Network Function Virtualization, or, or at least that, that whole concept. The infrastructure itself we refer to as NFEI, um, for Network Function Virtualization Infrastructure. Um, and, but the infrastructure itself isn't enough, right? You've got all of these, um, these VNFs, um, and essentially, most, most of these VNFs are essentially pro processing network traffic, um, but you also need to orchestrate these VNFs and steer packets through these VNFs. And that layer is something called MANO um, for management and orchestration. So when you hear about NFE, you'll hear about either NFEI or NFE MANO. Um, but essentially, you know, network function virtualization is about bringing the cloud to the telco world. It's, it's everything that the rest of the industry have learned um, about cloud, about the value of the abstraction, about the value of, of you know, separating the, the, the oper operators of the infrastructure from the, the application owners and kind of unlocking a lot more um, innovation on top. That's essentially what telcos are trying to do with NFE. So to get into a little bit more of the details and a little bit more of some of the, the technical details that, that's specific to, to um, NFE, um, I've used the title here, Driving in the Fast Lane. And if you want to read some more about this stuff, one of our, our excellent product managers at Red Hat, Steve Gordon, has published a series of blog posts with this title where he goes into a lot more detail. Um, and Steve was actually one of the people in OpenStack in the telco working group who really, really helped 
the OpenStack community understand some of these requirements and really translate it, the requirements into something that, that kind of made sense for OpenStack. So just as a remi reminder, I keep talking about the abstraction here, right? The abstraction between the, the, the infrastructure operator um, and, and the, the abstraction between the operator and the application owner, the tenant. Um, to keep it really, really simple, this is the abstraction, right? This is, I want a machine, I want a computer, um, and this is how I request it. I'm not filing a ticket, I'm not you know, walking up to someone's desk and asking for a computer, I'm self-service going to something like this, and basically, all I have to choose here is a flavor, so the type of machine I want it to run on, and an image, the, the operating system I want to run on that. Um, at an even simpler level, this is the abstraction, right? It's create me a server, um, a medium-sized computer, and run Fedora on top of it. So if I'm, a, if I'm someone wanting to launch a VNF in, in, in a telco environment, um, it's a pretty specialized application, right? It's, it's forwarding, um, it's essentially processing and forwarding packets, and it needs to be able to do that, preferably at, at line rate. Um, so it really, really cares about high performance, but also um, deterministic high performance, right? Not only do you want to run at line rate, but you want to consistently run at line rate, so you don't want any jitter. So rather than just some random medium-sized virtual machine, you, know, you might want to say, I want a virtual machine that <clears throat> essentially has eight physical cores dedicated as virtual CPUs to this, this virtual machine. Um, maybe I want my memory spread across two NUMA nodes, two physical NUMA nodes, um, and I want to expose the, that, that memory spread to the virtual machine as, as a virtual NUMA topology. Um, maybe I want to use dedicated host memory, and I want to use um, two megabyte pages, and maybe I want the actual networking input to be you know, essentially a physical input with SRIOV, um, so two SRIOV virtual functions assigned, but also for those, the, 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 the NUMA nodes associated with those virtual functions to, 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 to be the same ones used in the virtual machine. So, you know, fast, go back a few years in OpenStack and say this is the kind of um, thing I want to to, to run on, on top of OpenStack, right? The initial reaction would have been, five, be gone, it's not cloudy, this has nothing to do with OpenStack, go away. Um, you know, just just not. So I, I don't know, I use, I use this quote which I like, quite like, which is, let's not think about OpenStack as what EC2 was in October 2008 when, when Amazon decided to remove the beta label, right? That's, that's often what we kind of tie our kind of, what is cloud, what makes sense for OpenStack, we, we look back to then. Um, but it isn't actually anyone's quote, I just made it up. Um, so, <clears throat> what I talked about there, those hardware requirements, could we express those as a flavor? In that abstraction I talked about, I'm choosing what type of machine um, I want, could we create a high performance flavor, which says um, CPU policy dedicated, which means um, I want dedicated CPUs for my virtual CPUs, I want to use two NUMA nodes, um, and I want to use large pages. Can we express all of this as a as a high performance flavor. So when you go to that um, dialogue to launch a virtual machine, just select a high performance um, virtual machine. And we, we absolutely can do that through the, the OpenStack abstraction without doing anything unnatural. So that's just one example of what NFE requirements look like and what the process of, of understanding NFE requirements and kind of mapping it to something that makes sense for OpenStack. Um, and so we're talking here about specialized computing resources for these you know, fairly specialized um, applications and, and how to expose these specialized computing resources through the OpenStack abstraction. We're generally talking about high performance and deterministic performance, as, as I said. We're also talking about reliability. You know, carrier grade, telco, five nines, all of that still applies here, but um, maybe it's at the application layer and maybe it's, it's we're talking about how the, the the infrastructure layer enables the application layer to, to kind of um, respond more quickly to failures and, and provide a really, really, really reliable um, application. And we're also talking about how to steer packets between functions. This is, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about um, for NFE. NFE um, but I, I firmly believe that all of these capabilities, it makes sense for OpenStack to provide these. It's not unnatural. And actually, each of these have applications and relevancy outside the telco world. Um, and so it's not, something, it's not something we should fear, essentially. So for me, um, I guess sometimes 
at least amongst the developer community, sometimes when my peers inside the developer community starting to talk about this and starting to talk about, you know, while we're, we as a community are under a lot of pressure and, and have a lot of work to do, even just to, to make OpenStack as it is, you know, really work well at scale and, and be very reliable, why we should care about all these new requirements, which maybe we hadn't really thought about when, when OpenStack was first created. And so for me, what, what I try and talk about is, Imagine this opportunity for OpenStack, right? Imagine this telco world. All the telcos we, we all know about, all of their data centers, um, the competitive pressures that these telcos are feeling, the, the, you know, the kind of legacy kind of mode that these data centers run in, the frustration they have with that, um, and that these telcos are, are now seeing you know, open source and OpenStack as you know, the fundamental way that they're going to solve this. And it's not one or two telcos, it's the entire telco industry um, have developed consensus around this and this is the way they are going to change their data centers. Um, to me, that's a huge, huge opportunity for OpenStack. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new wave of users, it's a new, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's adding more diversity to what we're trying to do um, and welcoming those use cases, welcoming those users uh, um, is, is really gonna be beneficial for OpenStack um, as a whole. And so for me, you know, NFE is all about just tra transforming the telco world with an open source um, stack up and down from, from, from top to bottom. So the OpenStack mission, like why, why is that relevant to OpenStack, right? Or, um, and to me, if you, if you look at the OpenStack mission, the one that always stands out to me is, is this ubiquitous word, right? Um, it's, 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 to me, this, this ubiquitous word um, you know, conjures up the image of in a future world where basically you know, much of the computing resources that we all use for our day-to-day -day lives or for research or for, for industry or for finance or whatever it is, that way, maybe way, way, way down the stack, that is essentially, um, it tends to be OpenStack that's providing those resources. That's the kind of ubiquity, ubiquity you are aiming for here. And for OpenStack to be what the entire telco industry is, is basically standardizing on, um, I think that's you know, something that OpenStack should totally celebrate and is really part of our mission. Um, so that's it for me. Finishing a little bit early, but uh, thank you very much. Um, I saw in some of the earlier presentations, people were talking about some of the challenges with OpenStack deployment. From, a, from your perspective or a Red Hat perspective, what do, what do you think are the biggest challenges with OpenStack and maybe steps that have been taken to overcome them? I cut most of that except the last three or four words. Yeah, I, I, okay, sorry, I clipped myself there. But um, yeah, what, are the, you know, what are the biggest challenges you see or even Red Hat sees with OpenStack deployment? And then what are kind of the things that have been done to address them? Yeah, okay, challenges um, for deployment. So clearly, um, you know, the, for, for me as a, as a developer working on OpenStack, there's a transition from um, the, the world that developers tend to see, which is, you know, it, you tend to be working in a very false environment of say just one virtual machine. It's a very small virtual environment. There's, there's a world of difference between that and a real kind of production deployment of, of OpenStack. Um, and I think what we're seeing with maybe some of the deployment challenges is just the disconnect between what the developers are kind of exposed on and working on a day-to-day -day basis and what we've kind of built a community around versus actually what's happening in, um, in real life. So, you know, for me, going back years and years, what I've always wanted to do is try and build more of a consensus approach to the deployment challenge, which, which maybe is one of the, the kind of biggest challenges for our community. How do we build a consensus approach around that, how do we get more people actually working on that together, as opposed to that just being some value add that vendors pr pr provide as differentiation without kind of collaborating together. Um, so Red Hat have been taking that approach now for a few years with um, components like working on Ironic as our bare metal provisioning service. And, you know, there's a lot of interest around that. Um, working on the, the OpenStack puppet modules, which are used in a whole bunch of different places. Um, and working on Triple O, which is our, basically our use of OpenStack to deploy, um, basically to deploy and provision OpenStack. Um, so my big hope and I think biggest challenge for OpenStack is getting more collaboration and consensus around deployment. Um, 
But I think in terms of us working on, on OpenStack, I think one of the, the biggest challenges for us as a distribution to get a hold of is just the sheer complexity uh, of the kind of choice that, that is in OpenStack. You know, the, the, the number of configuration options, the number of deployment scenarios, the number of partner technologies that we want to enable. It's like this infinite matrix of, of stuff that we're trying to essentially enable while also providing a really kind of rock solid um, deployment and operational experience. And, and there's a real tension between what you can do if, if you choose your own architecture and build your own deployment um, solution for that versus um, the challenge of trying to build something that, that kind of su supports every possible deployment choice. Um, so we've, we've, you know, we've been working on that for quite a few years. It's a really, really big challenge, um, and we're succeeding in that right now. But I think it's, it's, it's that, that's kind of one of the big challenges that we've been um, dealing with over the past few years, I think. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Thank you.